Yeah, so for people like myself who've been uh, working in developed countries for decades, um, I think there's a very clearly and well understood relationship between participation in education and improved literacy in populations and the benefits that that brings um, to uh, the health of the population. So uh, for young women, for example, who've had the chance to complete primary education, we know that uh, maternal and child health outcomes are so much better. What we hadn't really thought about was whether or not literacy had a similar impact on health in more developed countries. And um, over the last several years, we've, uh, we've investigated this a lot more closely and can see that there are really very direct relationships between literacy and health outcomes, people's ability to use preventive services, people's ability to make appointments in the health system and navigate the sometimes complex uh, ways in which the health system makes demands on us. And, uh, and so we've really started to understand that a lot better and, uh, and started to take some actions that might um, help people who have difficulty in navigating the health system. So people like me who've studied literacy over the years um, know that um, you can have a general set of skills in reading and writing and numeracy, but their importance um, is whether you can apply those skills in different situations. And the more, more able you are to use these skills to make decisions for yourself and for your family, then uh, the, the better the outcome. And what we know is that a lot of people who in everyday life would be considered well-educated, highly literate, still struggle because they, they become intimidated in a health context. Uh, they're, they're confronted with unfamiliar words, they're probably anxious about their health condition and so uh, have difficulty with their health literacy. Um, and uh, we actually have to do better both to support people to become more confident in health situations, in making decisions about their health, and we also have to make adaptations to the health system so that the information people need is more accessible, easy to understand, um, and more easy for them to act on. And that's what health literacy is about. So you'd probably be surprised, um, there have not been any national surveys done in the UK so it's hard to say exactly what the problem is in the UK but I don't think the UK is going to be so different from several other European countries and countries like Australia where I live now um, where we estimate somewhere between 45 and 60 percent of the population have what would be defined as inadequate health literacy. And, and by that I don't mean to um, label people particularly, but it's very practical. Um, these are people who, for example, would have difficulty interpreting dose and frequency on regularly prescribed medicines or when confronted with a nutrition label on food really wouldn't be able to make sense of it sufficient to help make an informed choice um, about the food. So it's not that complicated but, but surprisingly more than half the population in general have difficulty in making sense of these things that we think are pretty straightforward. So much more prevalent uh, uh, than you think, um, more prevalent among the older, older people in our population, more prevalent among poorer people in our populations, and more prevalent among people who don't have English as their first language, for example, as you might expect. It's not hard to see how um, uh, the challenge of lower levels of literacy or the intimidation provided by the health system uh, can actually result in all sorts of problems for people in navigating, um, you know, getting an appointment, um, understanding what's being told to them by a doctor or nurse, um, going away and uh, acting on, uh, on that. And um, as I think most people are well aware, there's a bit of a digital divide in the population. You know, again, it's partly age related. Um, younger people are much more um, able to cope with uh, digital information um, uh, as provided in its many forms than older people. Um, regrettably, it's the older people who are less well and more likely to be using the healthcare system. So we have to be very mindful of the fact that while we're 
terribly enthusiastic to digitise the, the health system, that actually the, the main cohort of people who use the health system um, may not be, may be the least well equipped to actually uh, manage that. That said, uh, I, I, have to, uh, I have to observe uh, that digitisation is really serving the health system very well. It's serving the professions within the health system, making more information more consistently available to uh, the professional who may be caring for you. Uh, and that's really important. It's, it's when we're asking a lot more of sick people uh, using digital technology that, that that starts to fall down a bit and we just have to be very mindful of, uh, of the populations that we're working with. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the simplest thing to say is that, that those people who are better educated and more confident in dealing with health professionals, for example, will continue to get better service out of our health and, health and social care systems. And those people less, less able will continue to get poor service. And you know, on, you know, I've said on many occasions that if we don't actively do something about this, the health gap between those who are better off and those who are less well off will continue to widen. One practical thing that we can do to start to close the gap a bit more, and that's to make health information more easily accessible, easier to understand and easier to act on um, in the way in which we provide the information and we support people to take action. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So for example, um, Scotland are very advanced in their thinking about health literacy and do have a national policy and programme um, to improve health literacy in their population. Situation in the other parts um, of the UK uh, is highly variable. I think um, in all of the jurisdictions there's now an understanding that this matters. It matters especially in uh, a healthcare system where we have a commitment to getting uh, greater um, patient engagement and community engagement in healthcare decisions. So the, the idea of no decision about me without me um, is a great slogan, but it doesn't mean much if a person doesn't feel they're well in, sufficiently well informed and doesn't have the confidence to actually you know, engage in shared decision making uh, about their health. So if that's our commitment, uh, then we actually need to do quite a lot more to ensure that people are um, able uh, to obtain the information that they need and to understand it better than many people can at the moment. And um, that requires active intervention and it's not immediately clear that we have systems and programmes in place that, that mean that that will happen. Um, so, um, uh, good progress but some way to go, I would say. I think um, the most important advances are going to come from changes to the system. Um, uh, changes to the way we train healthcare professions, the expectations that we have of our doctors and nurses and pharmacists and others in the way they communicate uh, with their patients and um, how we can go about systemically improving the quality of communication that's going on uh, in the healthcare system. Because at the moment, by and large, we know that it's mostly ineffective. Uh, we know that people come away from discussions with their doctor or nurse, uh, with the pharmacist, not really understanding what was communicated to them. And so we've got, we've got, to, we've got to get better at communication within the healthcare system. In the long term, of course, um, I, I do think that we have to use our education systems more effectively to build, um, in, uh, build people's knowledge and understanding about health related issues and how to use the healthcare system through school and adult uh, and continuing education. Mm -hmm.